you're all wondering why I asked you here. Now, thank you very much. Thank you for coming. I've called this press conference to announce that I am a candidate for the presidency. Ronald Wilson Reagan, age 64, former sports commentator, former film star, and former governor of California, makes his long-awaited bid to become the 39th president of the United States. I'm running because I have grown increasingly concerned about the course of events in the United States and in the world. In just a few years, the vital measurements of economic decay, inflation, unemployment, and interest rates have more than doubled, at times reaching 10% or even more. Government at all levels now absorbs more than 44% of all of our personal income. It's become more intrusive, more coercive, more meddlesome, and less effective. Within hours, Reagan was launching the first phase of his campaign in Florida, where he found himself in a situation all too familiar to seekers of America's highest office, a gun attack. In the past few weeks, President Ford had been attacked twice, but this time the gunman had only a water pistol. The secret serviceman assigned to Reagan as soon as he officially became a candidate for president quickly overpowered him. Reagan's challenge to Ford is being taken seriously by the Republican Party leadership in Washington and particularly by those closest to the president. Yes, During it's the a past few weeks, there's been a marked give, shift to the right in Dutch Ford's Reagan, campaign speeches him, uh, in the sports field, of Reagan has become a, more apparent. An award tonight, one of the uh, great awards of... Many leading Coming Republicans from think it Sam would be a first race. Dear the the real Congress, possibility that Ford could uh, be the first Republican president such since 1884 from to seek the, the nomination and be denied on behalf of Sam Rayburn uh, to a great governor, Governor Dutch Reagan of California. Certainly, Reagan well, is a, a charismatic report. public figure. He was His years in Hollywood have taught him how to be humorous, outraged, and modest. Very happy to talk to an audience. Yeah. Yeah. About to announce your candidacy then tonight. <laughs> no. Not at all. When? What? When? Well, if that ever happens, it'll be sometime later. I think that's a question that's about uh, at least a year or more uh, premature. See you next year, then. Reagan first became a nationally known political figure in 1966 when Republican bosses in California asked him to run for governor. At the time, he was not entirely without political experience. During his time in Hollywood, Apart from making over 50 films, he spent six years as president of the Actors Guild, and a radical president at that. But his participation in politics came only at the end of World War II, when his film career was on the decline. As a member of the Democratic Party, he campaigned on behalf of Helen Gahagan Douglas in 1950, in one of the bitterest Senate races ever. She lost to one Richard Milhouse Nixon, Reagan later switched parties, and by the early 60s, was a key figure on the right of the Republican. Reagan, the son of a shoe salesman, was educated at Eureka College, Illinois, run by the... He's remembered there as a leader of a student strike that forced college officials to abandon cuts in the educational program and relax the rules forbidding smoking, drinking and dancing. His academic record was indifferent, but he excelled in debates, drama, and sports. The former Hollywood cowboy still takes a keen interest in baseball, the sport that gained him a national reputation as a broadcaster in the 1930s. In those days, he was known as Dutch Reagan. It was while he was covering a baseball game in California that he took time off to audition in Hollywood and launched himself on a new career. Reagan's wife, Nancy, is a former Hollywood starlet who takes an active interest in politics. The daughter of a wealthy Chicago neurosurgeon, she married Reagan in 1952, four years after his divorce from Joan Weimar, who left him, so the story goes, because he used to lecture her on politics at the breakfast table. He has four children, two from each marriage. <laughs> Reagan 
Reagan evolved into a conservative because of communist activity in Hollywood. In political life, he still retains his Hollywood connections and can call on stars of his own day to campaign for him. Right from the start of his political life, Reagan's favorite themes have been denunciations of state handouts to the poor, taxes, and big government. But you vote for me. Vote for me if you believe in yourself. If you believe in your right to control your own destiny and plan your own life. Yes, and have to say the save with the spending of your own money. Honorable Ronald Reagan. In an important speech in 1966 to the National Press Club in Washington, Reagan outlined what he called his creative society, continuing to aim his appeal to conservative voters and to promote his image as an honest amateur amongst professional politicians. Mr. President, now, I am not a politician. This has been pointed out by some of my opponents recently. But I have a deep-seated belief that the ordinary citizens created this country and this system of ours, that it was evol involved by these ordinary citizens with the idea that it would be run by ordinary citizens. And I think that it's high time that more of us brought the fresh air of common sense thinking to some of the problems that confront us. I would like to suggest for our thinking today, and I've proposed this before, there is no such thing as a left or right. We're faced with a choice of up or down. And the up has been the dream of this country for 200 years, up to the ultimate in individual freedom consistent with law and order. The down leads toward the lockstep and the deadly dullness of totalitarianism. And anyone who is willing to embark on programs that will exchange individual freedom in return for some kind of material security is embarked on that downward path. And for them to continue to believe that they can trade away freedom without eventually winding up in that deadly totalitarianism, whether they want it or not, is to be as short-sighted as a fellow going into the poultry business without a rooster. They're putting a great deal of confidence in the story. Thank you very much. The speech was important, not only because of its homespun political philosophy, but also because it was delivered in the national capital to a national audience. And when it became clear that he'd won the race for governor in California, his acceptance speech appealed across party lines and provided another hint that perhaps his political ambitions were not confined to that state alone. We'll make every effort we can to have those people join us and then We'll do something else. Then we'll talk to those people who perhaps are independents and who stayed home from the polls for that reason. And we'll talk to those Democrats who, by following another course, have indicated that they share our dislike of what has been taking place in California in these last several years. And we'll ask them because our cause crosses party lines. When Reagan took office in 1967, California was spending a million dollars a day more than its revenue. The new governor promised to tackle this problem by slashing state expenditure by 10%, cutting the welfare system and educational budgets, and curtailing government growth. To crack down on student demonstrations. Student campuses, already restless because of the Vietnam War, were immediately inflamed when the governor, as part of his first year program of economies, cut the proposed university budget by 17%. And at the Sacramento University campus, he ran into a storm of vocal protest. But because I believe, and I'm quite sure, that there's nothing that I could say that would in any way create an open mind in some of you, but perhaps there are some. <laughs> The program, may I urge you, 
that the program has not begun. We will have our speakers and our position stated shortly. Will you please be courteous and let the governor speak? As governor, as governor, I am going to represent the people of this state. Campus opposition to Reagan continued throughout most of his term of office, but Reagan was confident that he'd assessed the mood of the mass of the people correctly. When he cracked down later on another protest by students at Berkeley, he had substantial public support. orders died down, Reagan's position also moderated, and significantly, by the time he left office last January, he'd increased California's higher education budget by 100%. In 1968, when Richard Nixon was the leading Republican candidate, Reagan continually denied that he would run for his party's presidential nomination, but his supporters decided to put his name forward anyway. For someone who wasn't officially a candidate, he attracted an impressive amount of backing, extending to the expense of television advertising. Why do Oregonians want Governor Reagan for president? Because he is the only politician I know who has done exactly what he said he would do in his political campaign. He has the ability to communicate his concerns to the people. There is no doubt that Ronald Reagan has the leadership ability that this country needs. Because the way he has balanced the budget in California proves to me the same thing can be done in Washington. Because he believes in the ability of the individual, in the decentralization of power, and the return of the government to the people. Because as a mother, I am concerned about the violence in our streets, and I believe Governor Reagan would check this. Because I believe that the creative society in California, in which he has involved many citizens, holds much greater hope for progress in this country than does the expenditure of large sums of federal money. Governor Reagan a one Republican who can lead the Republican Party to victory in November. On primary day, vote for Governor Reagan. Republican primary, Reagan took 23% of the vote against Nixon, an encouraging performance for a non-candidate. He followed it up just one month before the Republican convention in Florida, which selected the party's presidential candidate, with an important speech to the Republican National Committee. Americans will we'll respond, respond to a leadership, leadership which, which countenances neither bigotry nor anarchy. anarchy. A leadership which demands that every citizen is fully protected, protected in his person, his property, and his, and his opportunity. A leadership which refuses to barter propriety for indulgence or integrity for political gain. And yes, a leadership which asserts that if we must fight for freedom, we will fight to win. That if we, we ask, ask our, our young men, men that, if that if we ask our young men to bear arms, the power and the might and the resolve of this nation will stand with them and behind them. That we will never again abandon them, not even one. If we're not willing to say these things, if we're not willing to proclaim them proudly and to act accordingly, we deny our heritage, our cause, and our country. And the day will surely come when those who are now young will ask us, where were you when America called for leadership? What in God's name were you doing that was more important than the survival of this nation and the fate of the world? Thank you. the non-candidate decided he was in the race after all. I have made it plain all this time and for the past several months that come Wednesday night, once placed in nomination, I would in effect, would in fact be a candidate before the, the convention by reason of being placed in nomination. The California delegation has made a decision now about 48 hours in advance, and I have to tell you that in one way, it certainly makes life easier uh, than it's been these last few days. It does clarify the situation. 
And so, uh, yes, as of this moment, uh, in response to that uh, resolution by the California delegation. Among the delegates was considerable. Five for Nixon. Three votes West for Governor, Governor Ronald Reagan. Reagan. When Gerald Ford, then chairman of the Republican National Committee, invited Reagan to address the convention, anybody watching could have been forgiven for thinking that the Republican Party nominee was not Nixon, but Reagan. And under the motion, the governor of California will be recognized. didn't win that year, but he did get support from 18 states and 30% of the votes Nixon got. He timed his entry into the race well, and he timed his exit equally well. We're gathered here with one common bond uniting us, and that is the knowledge that this great nation cannot stand or survive four more years of the policies that have been guiding us for too many of the recent years. Therefore, because the only vehicle in the great two-party system with the potential to replace the leadership now in Washington is the Republican Party, I hereby and proudly move on behalf of my fellow Californians that this convention declare itself as unanimously and united behind the candidate Richard Nixon as the next president of the United States, and I so move. Two years later, in 1970, Reagan was again back in the public eye, seeking a second term as governor of California. <laughs> in many ways shows up the difference between what a politician says and what he is able to do. He attacks government spending, but doubled it in California in eight years. He opposes higher taxation, but in California he nearly doubled that as well, though in so doing, placed California on a sound fiscal footing and turned a $194 million deficit into a $500 million surplus. It was a record that added to his stature as a national politician, as well as his standing in California. In his campaigning, Reagan made the most of his economic record, as a governor who'd restored the state's fortunes while still pressing ahead with expansion. One way he was able to do it was by cutting down the number of people receiving welfare handouts. The total dropped by nearly a quarter of a million during his first two years as governor. Largest and this, it was clear, was one of his most prized in achievements. In January, there were 182,600 fewer Californians on welfare than there were last March. Had welfare gone unreformed in California, state social welfare department projections show there would now be 538,000 more persons on our welfare rolls than there actually are. The cost of the increase in caseload would have amounted to an additional $148 million burden on the taxpayers. During January alone, California taxpayers 
would have had to pay $29,600,000 more than they actually did had there been no reform. Recent opinion polls have shown Reagan edging closer to Ford, and the front covers of the latest American news magazines underline just how great a threat Reagan now appears. The latest poll following Ford's cabinet reshuffle actually gives Reagan a narrow lead. At Reagan's headquarters in Washington, his supporters claim that Ford is a weak leader, whereas the former governor of California has proved he can handle a large budget. They remind you that the Ford administration currently has a $30 billion deficit, whereas Reagan left California in surplus. The major theme in Reagan's campaign, according to campaign director Lynn Nofziger, is an attack on Washington's inefficient bureaucracy, with which President Ford is closely involved. Ahead of both men are the 30 primary elections, which will have a key influence on the choice of candidate. If Reagan does well early on, then he could force the president to withdraw from the race. Unfortunately for Reagan, three of the early primaries are in conservative states likely to favor him and in Illinois, where he was born. The campaign is likely to prove an uphill fight for Reagan against the president, and it'll be a severe test of his organization. At another time, challenging an incumbent president for the party nomination might be political suicide, but Reagan knows he's fighting a president who was not elected. With Ford shifting right to beat off Reagan's challenge, there are specific now differences you can cite to with Mr. Ford, and how specifically you could do a better job than the president in translating the laws of Reagan. Whether there were any real differences well, between them, I have already said and have pledged to the people in my party and to others that. I am going to abide by the 11th commandment, uh, which in, was given birth in California and which says thou shalt not speak ill of another republic. I've made no difference of, or a list of the differences between us. I'll campaign on what I think should be done, the proposals that I would make, what I believe the philosophy of government should be. I'm sure the president will campaign in the same way. And then it will be up to you and uh, to the American people to draw uh, the distinction where there are differences and to make their decision. In comments on subjects like detente, though, Reagan's differences with Ford are now becoming clear. A decade ago, we had a military superiority. Today, we're in danger of being surpassed by a nation that has never made any effort to hide its hostility to everything we stand for. Through detente, we've sought peace with our adversaries, areas, and we should continue to do so. But we must make it plain that we expect a stronger indication that they also seek a lasting peace with us. In my opinion, the root of these problems lies right here in Washington, D.C. Our nation's capital has become the seat of a buddy system that functions for its own benefit, increasingly insensitive to the needs of the American worker who supports it with his taxes. Today, it's difficult to find leaders who are independent of the forces that have brought us our problems. The Congress, the bureaucracy, the lobbyists, big business, and big labor. If America is to survive and go forward, this must change. It will only change when the American people vote for a leadership that listens to them, relies on them, and seeks to return government to them. We need a government that is...